going to talk to us about architectural <coughs> style and the rhetoric of nationalism in Finland at 1885-1905. At least that's his overall framework. Uh, he, he's an um, assistant professor at the University of Colorado at Denver uh, and lectures in, in, in the Southern California Institute of Architecture. He's a journalistic work, he's also been a uh, year of the Architecture Association at the time and we're uh, very pleased to have him come back to talk to us. Thanks, it's nice to be back. I couldn't have thought of a better um, introduction to my own um, talk than the one we just heard. I found it yesterday very curious that no one had mentioned earlier uh, some of the more standard texts written by historians on this subject. Uh, it was almost as if uh, some of us architects and historians are operating in vacuums or something. Um, Benedict Anderson particularly, I think, could have maybe would have uh, really set the tone if he had been asked to come and talk, but that might have been another conference. Um, supposedly, the 19th, I'll begin. supposedly the 19th century was the age of nationalism. But Benedict Anderson suggests that this whole notion of nationalism as a driving force uh, around the world is at least as potent now as it was in the 19th century, and I would tend to agree. One need only think of what's going on particularly right now in the Baltic states with the Latvians, the Estonians, the Lithuanians, one can think of the Eritreans, the Azerbaijanis, Kurds, Tamils, pa uh, Basques, Georgians, uh, the Palestinians who um, uh, all struggling for uh, an identity as nations, nationhood self-determination. The other thing that also strikes Anderson very strongly um, is the way in which not so much that people kill for nationalism, but the way in which they are willing to die for it. And when one, th when one thinks of how powerful a force uh, this is, considering the daily, uh, sort of like little box scores that we see in a newspaper, uh, there are four, five, and six-year-old little children which daily have their skulls blown open uh, by fully armed um, soldiers in the Middle East, for instance. Also, there is the problem of um, definition here. Nation, nationality, nationalism. I'd like to quote Benedict Anderson quoting Hugh Seaton Watson. Um, Benedict An Anderson says that Hugh Seaton Watson sadly observes, and I quote, thus I'm driven to the conclusion that no scientific definition of the nation can be devised, yet the phenomenon, ha phenomenon has existed and exists. We must wonder how it is possible that the concept of nationalism wields such political and emotional power in the legitimization of, of cultural independence. I will attempt in the next 30 minutes or so to shed light on this question and a few others, and also to address some of the some of uh, the concerns that Julian brought up at the end of yesterday, concerns which I, I myself share. But some of the questions um, are these. Can a national style be invented or created? If so, what would its sources be? And by what standards can we then judge whether the style is successful as a nationalist one or not. My starting point actually in my, my interest in this whole area was initiated by a 1979 article on the question of nationalism in Finland around the turn of the century written by Ritva Tuomi, now Ritva 
Vera, written in 1979. I would like to return to the Benedict Anderson's book, Imagine Communities, and actually go to the third paradox, since the other two have already been mentioned. And he says, and I quote, the political power of nationalism versus their philosophical poverty and even incoherence. This is one of the paradoxes. In other words, unlike most isms, and I'll just repeat what was mentioned before, nationalism has never produced its own grand thinkers. No Hobbes's, Tocqueville's, Marx's, or, or Weber's. Weber's. Um, and I also disagree with this. It seems that he has slighted uh, numerous individuals, and, but specifically Herder. In reaction to the Enlightenment's goal to unite diverse nations and their cultures under, under universal governing laws based on reason, Herder championed the appreciation and cultivation of indigenous cultures for their distinguishing characteristics, particularly their language, which I would refer to as perhaps patois, um, to subjugate national and cultural differences to a normalizing, normalizing, normalizing rule of reason seemed essentially pernicious to Herder. Each nation for Herder was a result of a unique physical environment producing unique cultural characteristics. The duty of each nation for the good of mankind in general, yes, he had big ideas, for the good of mankind in general was to cultivate its specific constituent culture. The Nietzsche's Volk ist Volk es hat seine nationale Bildung wie seine Sprache. Herder also claimed that the characteristic expression of a culture lay in its language, of which the purest form was preserved in the, the untainted poetry of the folk. For Herder, and I quote, the genius of a language is also the genius of the literature of the nation. Language as, and I quote again, Dictionary of the soul was at the same time myth mythology and a marvelous epic of the actions and speeches of all beings. Thus a constant fable with passion and interest, song, poetry, and music all rolled into one. And it's curious that there's a, 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 a Heidegger picks up, I think, uh, some of this interest and uh, Heidegger, and I quote, says, Language is a primordial poetry in which a people speaks being. Conversely, the great poetry by which a people enters the hi into history initiates the molding of its language." End of quote. Um, Heidegger's etymological project, obviously it's different, there are echoes of Herder, but Heidegger's etymological project of excavating uh, original meanings from language, that is always going back, digging, digging out to find the original meaning, uh, giving language priority in trying to investigate, uh, give meaning, etymology, uh, ontological meaning. In contrast to Enlightenment, back to Herder, in contrast to Enlightenment alienation, prim primitive man was reconciled with nature in a harmonious coexistence expressed through mythology and animism, uh, a myth. Primitive man, this whole notion itself is a myth, Primitive man, thinking in symbols, allegories, and metaphors, created mythology, and thus these poems, thus with these poems, he imitated not nature, but, according to Herder, I quote, the naming, the creating, naming Godhead, end of quote. Primitive man, united with nature, is able to celebrate it through poetry, through language. For Herder, it is this spontaneous and emotional contact with nature that the age of reason threatened. One had to embark on this project of salvaging culture and, and language immediately as the evidence was ever more rapidly being destroyed. And I quote, now, now, the remnants of all living folkways are rolling with a last hurried plunge into the abyss. Another half century and it is too late, end of quote. Without the preservation of language, all would be lost. And I quote again from Herder, a nation has nothing more valuable than the language of its fathers. In it lives its entire spiritual treasury of tradition, history, religion, and, and principles of life, 
all its heart and soul. To deprive such a nation of its language or to, de or to demean it is to deprive it of its sole immortal possession transmitted from parents to children. For Herder, the essential characteristic of a, nation, of a nation was the authentic, pure language of its ancestors, ensuring cultural continuity. Not only would language create the recognition and appreciation of a culture, but would also provide resistance to possible threats <coughs> of absorption by imperialist forces. Nationalism for subject cultures in Europe, and I quote from Wadinen in 1931, has been the result mainly of two factors. First, the awakening of linguistic groups to a consciousness of cultural identity, and secondly, the development among such linguistic groups of an ambition to achieve political independence. Now, specifically to Finland. At the beginning of the 19th century, Herder and the German Romantics in general, Erin Novalis, Jean-Paul Schelling, Schlegel Brothers, were extensively studied at the University of Turku by a group known as, it, obviously, the Turku Romantics. In 1822, Elias Lundroth entered that very university at Turku and in June 1827 presented his master's degree thesis titled Weinemönen, A Divinity of the Ancient Finns. Somewhat fortuitously, in 1827, the university burnt, uh, burnt down in the Great Turku Fire. Lundrat, with no classes to attend, set out in the, in the spring of 1828 to collect folk songs. Between 1829 and 1831, he published four fascicles. In 1831, he became secretary of the Finnish Literature Society. Its goals were summarized thus, and I quote from its charter. Because it is the society's aim to work for the cultivation of all subjects that are related to a knowledge of the fatherland or to the development of the Finnish language, the society intends to collect all printed and written works concerning Finland's antiquity, mythology, geography, statistics, and the Finnish language and poetry, Finnish songs, old sayings, and antique objects, as well as all publications irrespective of subject matter written in Finnish and whenever possible to publish publish works useful for the development of the Finnish language. History and literature um, to give encouragement and, and also to give encouragement by means of prizes to the writing and translation of books on these subjects by competent authors and to the study of specific problems related to Finland's history, literature, language. End of quote. Sorry for the Okay. Uh, one has to remember here that Finland was, was, um, was a territory governed by Sweden for over 600 years. Then during the Napoleonic Wars was ceded uh, to the Russians uh, in 1808. Um, and the Finnish language all through that time had, been, had never been written down except by uh, uh, people of the church who actually were writing down the myths more in order to uh, have a catalog of uh, pagan practices which needed to be stamped out. In 1835, Lindroth published what has now come to be known as the proto Kalevala. In 1849, he published a greatly expanded version known as the new Kalevala or the Kalevala proper. Uh, both were subjective arrangements of songs collected throughout Karelia and Eastern Finland. The act of unifying the disparate songs into an epic spelt the end of its living development. No longer would, uh, this is just a side point almost, no longer would singers be required to carry on the tradition of improvisation since anyone could just refer to the master text. The ossification of singing cannot bl be blamed solely on the publication of the new Kalevala. Uh, nonetheless, combined with its contemporary cultural and intellectual changes, it created a powerful force contributing to such an unfortunate demise. This criticism, however, pales in comparison with Galvao's most important contribution, the recording of the language for a culture-seeking identity. 
the Galagoa, became the cultural document par excellence for an ideology seeking nationhood. We've all heard there's a cliche culture is language, language is culture. And there's another aspect to this which I think is, uh, which Benedict um, Anderson, I don't know him as Ben, it's Benedict to me, um, brings out. And that is the incredibly powerful influence of print, uh, the printed technology. He says, nothing served to assemble related vernaculars more than capitalism which, within the limits imposed by grammars and syntaxes, created, created mechanically reproduced print languages capable of dissemination throughout the market. So the language now becomes fixed. There's some other points that Benedict Anderson makes, but I'll pass those up. Um, the Galavala, in turn, inspired or at least is associated with not only other works of literature, but also painting, the decorative arts, and music. One need only think of Sibelius, Alexis in music, Alexis Kivi in uh, literature, etc. Could I have the first slide? Oh, yeah. Do you understand this technology? I can figure it out. Oh, those are technology. For the architects, I've got some pretty pictures. <laughs> Very much like Lindroth's adventures, his trips collecting this the oral tradition of the Finns in recording the language. Other artists also made pilgrimages to Karelia and other parts of Finland, uh, mythologizing nature and the relationship of man in that nature. Here, for instance, is a painting by Holmberg, Kirkoski of 1854. And I'm just going to go through these quite quickly. And uh, this one I couldn't, I just had to include this one. It's the most sort of heroic baby I've ever seen in my whole life. Um, this is Golervo uh, Kapalanza, which is, Golervo um, uh, is a hero of the Galavala, and he's, he's uh, dropping his swaddling clothes. He's leaving his swaddling clothes. This particular painting. Um, and there is also this valorization um, of singers. This is Greta Hopsal, um, plays the plays the cantala, which is the, the instrument which which he would play and also sing the songs. Uh, this is of 1868. That was by Robert Ekman. This is Beck Kahalonen, Oyostia, short, uh, Oyostia um, shortcut of 1892. Uh, and here is, again, another Kahalonen painting. This one is called um, Kandelen Soite, the, the Kandela player of 1892, also. Here, what you see, and he, there's actually a description of of, of the, what he experienced when he goes to this uh, cabin 
in Eastern Finland and how tears came to his eyes and all this kind of thing. It kind of goes on and on, a very sentimental experience that he had. Um, but I think there's one consideration that I would li like to bring forward. And that is that uh, there seems to be a, a difference in the nature of nationalism as manifested or promoted through literature, the Kalevala, since it is, in essence, language, and the other arts which are not language-based, that actually depend on the language to get their narratives. The question is, for those believing that language is culture and culture is language, is, it just, this is just an aside, are they, that is the other arts, one step removed from the origin of culture? We can come back to that. The influence on the, of the Galavala on, cult, on cultural consciousness should not be underestimated. From approximately 1880 to 1905, it was a single main font of inspiration for all the arts. That's not to say that it was the only one, but it was the main one. The masters included Alexis Givy in literature, as I mentioned, Aksali Galala in painting, which is one of his. This is a, one of the scenes from, from uh, the Galavala, the defense of the Sambo of 1896. Um, Jan Sibelius in music, Lars Sonck, and the firm of Gesellius Lindgren in Sodden and in architecture, which I'll be talking about more in a moment. There's another painting by Galen Galala of another scene from um, the, the Galabama. Now, Beginning in the 1880s, artists and architects began making pilgrimages to Karelia in eastern Finland, again, the main source of Galavala's rune fragments, searching for the cultural origins and experience of nature which had assumed mythical proportions through the Galavala. This fascination with ancestral culture is known as Karelianism. Via these pilgrimages, artists and architects appropriated aspects of the peasant vernacular of Karelia for their own villa studios and projects. This is the painter um, Akseli Galen Galala's um, villa in Roavesi of 1895. He himself worked on it, literally building it, putting it together, uh, a Gesamtkunstwerk of borrowed details from Eastern Finland, very much in the arts and crafts tradition. There's, I'm sorry, but these aren't showing up very well. Uh, and some of the details on the inside, an axe post. This is another one. This is Emil Wikström, um, Visa of 1896. He was a sculptor. And I was hoping these ones would show up a bit better in detail. Um, you can see all around sort of working of the details of the wood uh, and the supports there. And I've got some close-ups, I believe. Um, the way in which the window frame itself is, is articulated, uh, the steps, characters of, I suppose, a bear, or I don't know what that is, a gopher, or uh, and some of the woodworking actual details of this fantasy book. Um, what's important to note here is that these buildings were not a simple mimicking of a vernacular. They are anything but the huts of peasants. They are, in a, they are, they are built and interpreted for an emergent middle class. Um, what you have also is a collection of various themes. One could never really decide where 
where did, where did this particular post come from? Where did this particular detail come from in Eastern Finland? Because the, ar the architecture there itself is so incredibly diverse anyway. Um, and a particular impact, it became a kind of a public thing, a much more public thing, um, this whole discussion of these pilgrimages to Eastern Finland with the publication of 1901 by a couple of uh, of the sketches and photographs made by a couple of architects, Yuri Blumstead and Victor Zuckstorf, um, in 1901, called Karelian Buildings and, and Decorative Styles. Lars Sank, someone who I'm going to talk about, was supposed to go on this trip, but he had just won a large competition for a new church in Turku. Gustav Strengel, a critic, wrote about this <coughs> in hindsight 1903 concerning the publication of this of this book on Karelian buildings and I'm gonna throw some more yeah just a little bit of detail um, I'll have to translate this um, the small group of travelers talking about Suxdorf and Blomstedt the small group of travelers turned with their packs full of drawings and souvenirs and soon the whole country knew that now we had a new Finnish style. It wasn't good enough the buildings were made according to those rules, but also the crafts took on these new, or if you like, old fashions to use, to use. And stores advertised uh, enthusiastically furniture made in the, in the same ancient style. But he goes on. But why do you scoff? This was all truly make-believe, he goes on. But beautiful make-believe. Shame that its time had to pass, and certainly it passed soon. Um, and he continues about decoration, and I think this will be one of the, the larger questions. The nation's own decorative style, just as well as the national rooms, the Kalavala, fit completely the saying, nothing new under the sun. He goes on, one nation has borrowed ideas from another, and both, <coughs> of, the, both of the nation's specialties are mainly the arrangement and collection of ideas um, always mixed, usually always mixed up anyway. But in any case, it has not yet been shown that Simpl uh, only ornament was adequate, adequate for the creation of a building style. Um, and I still continue the quote. But the Karelian vernacular buildings, no more than their handcrafts, could in the end give us anything but decorative objects, decorative principles. Foremost, their building skills were, were only in wood architecture and, and that therefore had no importance, uh, relevance um, for stone architecture, which as far as he's concerned is the most important. And, I think perhaps most importantly, and it has not come into use only, and it has come into use only with pleasure buildings, <coughs> kiosks, shop windows and such. Uh, another de detail of a visa for um, a window frame detail also. I think it's cool. This is uh, a much more better known structure. This is a hevitris, begun in 1902 by Gesellius Lindgren and Saarinen, a group of very young architects. I'm sure all of you are familiar with Eliel Saarinen, who was a member at that time. Um, and what you have here is that their studio built overlooking the lake from which the villa gets its name. There's actually three buildings, one for Gesellius, one for Lindgren, one for Sodingen. Um, and this one is Lindgren's. Um, and, but what you have here is, is literally, in Finland there were also um, no castles. There, were never, there was never a tradition of castles. There were stone fortresses and stone churches, and also 
the tradition of building with wood, logs mainly. And so what you have here is the medieval church or fortress foundation with a log cabin stuck on top. Uh, another shot of it. You can't really see it, but there's a, there's a window opening up above. You can just sort of see up there, uh, which is a direct quote from a structures like this one, which is in the Saudasari uh, Open Air Museum in Finland. It's on an island in Helsinki, I should say, uh, where they've literally collected these, uh, started in 1909, collecting these structures from around Finland, uh, all from all over Finland, and brought them in, into this uh, uh, an outdoor museum. This had already been happening in the 19th century in places like Norway and Sweden. Uh, there's a shot of the fireplace, you can barely see it, but I just want to point out the wrought iron uh, support work. Again, sort of medieval, supposedly medieval details. This particular uh, decoration, the painting of, of the ridge uh, of the ceiling vault is a medieval church interior quote. Uh, there's a shot of one of the decks looking outside. There's a studio itself. Obviously, this is not a peasant structure. Uh, again, another wrought iron door detail, a gate detail, uh, an interior. You can see uh, the vaulted roof. Uh, very much in the arts and crafts tradition, this particular uh, structure. This is another one of theirs. This is Sur Meriyoki of 1902. I just have one shot of the interior painting by illustration by Sarinen of the interior. Um, but there was, as I said, you know, this was a, the use of materials, this problem with wood um, that really couldn't be dealt with on an urban scale. It couldn't actually inform the architecture of urbanism. But there was also a problem with the use of stone in the, in the fabrication of the national style. Um, because modern technology was required for working the stone. And they, they actually, uh, in Scandinavia, they got their expertise by, with various trips to Aberdeen uh, in the 19th century because Aberdeen has, and I've been there, it has this tradition of, of this very hard gray granite. Um, I have to move along. These medieval, ca medieval churches and fortresses with their thick walls of cyclopic bond, uh, a, a type of construction possibly suit, suited only to freestanding villas and natural surroundings, were hardly realistic in an urban, urban context. In 1900, the Finnish architect Niels um, Vasastierna wrote a short comment on the Finnish style. He declared that the Finnish style must remain a utopia, a fantasy, since a national style cannot be based on national motifs alone. Decoration is no doubt important in the making of furniture as well as of buildings, but, and I quote from Vasastierna, no style is created out of the details since it is the total design that gives each style its specific character. Hence, if style cannot be created from decorative motifs, and since national romanticism was about such, about such decorative explorations, there could be no style which could be called properly national romanticism. That's a question. That's a question. According to uh, Neustrom and to Vasas Gierna and other critics of the same time. But let's see. Let's go on. Um, this is a very famous building by Gesellius Lindgren and Sodden in the Bohula Insurance Building in Helsinki, 18, 1899 to 1901. The Bohula also is a quote. The name actually comes from the Galavala also. Um, and like so many, and I agree with um, a recent book called 
Stone Style and Truth by Sixten Ringbom, um, where he, he says that, like so much of the buildings of national romanticism, this is similar to it in that it is basically a facade architecture. It is an architectural screen applied to a building block conceived independently of it. In the spring, and I'll explain, in the spring of 1899, the Bohila Company arranged the competition. The street facades would have to be of granite or some other finished stone. Uh, the prize money was divided among four entries and they gave a couple of other ones too. Um, And these elevations were completed in 1899 and were approved of in, 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 uh, in November of 1899. And what we have is an essentially eclectic creation embodying, uh, this is what Ringbaum says, Spanish commercial architecture, American Romanesque, uh, etc. What you have is, and they're all supposedly integrated with, uh, there it is on the right, another shot of it uh, here, integrated by using motifs from uh, Finnish flora and fauna, and there's an interior shot. Supposedly all this eclecticism was tied together in that way. Um, and I'll conclude now. From the few buildings that I've shown, which have been cla classified as National Romantic, we can see how highly problematic this category is. In general, the coherence or co cohesiveness of, of categories tends to collapse under <coughs> scrutiny anyway. The disparity inherent in the Karelian vernacular itself resisted the distortion and reduction of classification. This complexity denied any syncretic distillation into generic repeatable motifs or formula. Rather, rather, the value of Karelianism lay in its supplying material for the fabrication of a myth of origins. Its translation into built form could hardly be authentic. National Romanticism was an eclectic amalgam of various and conflicting materials, techniques, and decorative motifs. It's hardly uniform. With the rhetoric of nationalism, the style itself is not as important as a creation of a need or a desire to have a style. Moreover, this, this national style, whether successful or not, and I think we have our doubts, is nonetheless critical since it allows the ideological, the ideological rhetoric of nationalism to operate. The myth of a national style also satisfies ideological aspirations once they are initiated. Um, and my last comment. I'll close with a point from Nietzsche. History is created and not discovered. But in order to go on creating it, we must believe we are discovering it. Perhaps we could say the same for the attempt to create a national style in Finland at the turn of the century. Thanks. Uh, of 
uh, an exhibition on fashion. So can I introduce you to Happy? Thank you. Yes, yes indeed. The purpose of my talk is to show one building of Joseph Letznik, which is the National Library in Ljubljana, which uh, um, as a library for a newly created nation, Slovenia, um, was going to symbolize uh, as the container, or the sort, as the bank, if we can say, the keeper of the Slovenian literature. So the books of the language, of the Slovenian language, and then considering the language to be uh, the spine of a nation. So in this respect, Pletnik was going to pay a very special attention when designing this building. So Pletnik has been a pretty known figure in the last years. For those unfamiliar with Pletnik, I will say that he was born in Ljubljana, a city in northern Yugoslavia, which is the capital of Slovenia. Uh, he was born in, the, in a very Catholic family. His father was a cabinet maker, so he received a very careful education in what we could call the arts and crafts, or the love for materials. His father sent him to Graz, which is in Austria today, um, and he was trained there by an English, well, by a few people, particularly an English teacher, trained himself in the arts and crafts tradition. And with a deep knowledge of the use of materials, he will go to Vienna to work in the house, in a house uh, that designs furniture. He was 20 when he <coughs> arrived to Vienna. Vienna being not only the capital of the Austrian Hungarian, Austrian Hungarian Empire, but also probably the most cosmopolitan city in architectural terms at the time. <coughs> Fascinated by a drawing he saw of Otto Wagner, he knocked the door of this architect, he was accepted, he was a fantastic draftsman, and he became the preferred and the most loved student and pupil of Otto Wagner. Otto Wagner encouraged him to study architecture, something he did, so he finished architecture, travels around Europe, to Italy, Spain, and France, returned to Vienna, practiced for a while as an architect, and he joined the secession very enthusiastically, and he abandoned the secession with the same passion. Um, and uh, in 1912, he was proposed by Otto Wagner to succeed him as president of the Viennese Academy, as the top figure in the Viennese panorama, to lead the cultural moment of Vienna. 1912 uh, is few years before the First World War, and it's also few years before the collapse of the Austrian-Hungarian Empire. He was rejected by the government, the establishment, and the prince, and uh, with tremendous opposition and scandal in the press emerged. He was proposed again the year after, and he was rejected again mainly due to uh, ethnic reasons, because he was a Slavic person. And of course, one can understand that at those, in those years in which the Austria, Austrian Hungarian Empire was uh, in a deep crisis, the establishment in Vienna was deeply reluctant to have uh, uh, non-Austrians in uh, so critical positions as the Viennese Academy the director of the Evidence Academy. So this is a brief, very brief biography while he was in Vienna. Very depressed by this decision, he moved to Prague, invited by President Masaryk, uh, 
Czechoslovakia has been really has been recently declared independent. Masaryk proposed Pletnik to work in the castle of Prague and produce in the castle of Prague a series of interventions uh, that tended to create a sort of acropolis in that hill on top of the city of Prague. Plesny moved to Prague, he taught in Prague, where he had a very good, a very good friend he met in, in Wagner's studio, Gian Cotera, and then he became a, an, an intimate and very close friend of President Masaryk. And he shared with President Masaryk uh, this idea of creating an architecture that could have some sort of a national or nationalistic uh, feeling, flavor, uh, some nationalistic varnish, if we can say. So from that moment, I think from that depressive moment in which he was rejected from Vienna, Plesnik was uh, longing for his own national origin. In 1920, for his own national origin. In 1920, he returned to Slovenia, who was independent for the first time after 800 years. And again, the enthusiasm he has collected in, in Prague and in Vienna was going to be used in different buildings and urban proposals in Ljubljana. So I will, I will show the National Library, which I think it, synthes it synthesizes, uh, on one hand, his international training in Vienna, and also his love for vernacular traditions. And before showing the pictures, what I think is interesting to understand Pletznik figure is to find out the points of difference between him and Wagner. Although, no doubt, he admired deeply Otto Wagner, from, from whom he learned almost everything we can say. I think there are few, few standing points, three standing points I, I point out, by which uh, Plesnik could be uh, <coughs> differentiated uh, in, in, essential, in essential issues from his master. Um, and these three points that I will read, and I will try to be very brief, are uh, his attitude in the dilemma that occurs in Vienna on innovation and tradition, his attitude in relation to history and his ideal of the evocation of the past, and also his obsession for a lasting architecture. Well, it is, it is known that Vienna, at the turn of the century, which is as much as saying Wagner, or the secession first, Vienna was the inheritor of, uh, of theoretical contributions from the 19th century, many, theoret many theoreticians, particularly in the case of Vienna, uh, Gottfried Semper. It is known that the 19th century saw the sinking of the primacy of the classical language inherited from the 18th century in a world of confrontations which meant the origin of all sorts of stylistic revivalisms. These revivalisms were born from romantic positions and tended to revise architecture looking for an architecture that was specific or adequate for a nationality or for a religion, or for an institution. So it, it is in this battle of the styles in the 19th century where the character, the character in architecture appears to be the only way capable of consoling the great uh, stylistic variety which characterizes this turning of the century that Wagner has to live in. On top of that, the new materials will sharp this question. And in fact, Semper, has to rectify his reluctant position to iron, for example, when he saw the Crystal Palace. And he realized, he realized then that this material would open a new uh, future full of possibilities for architecture. But the new materials, on top of allowing new purposes and projects, appear to be a warranty of modernity, or what Wagner used to say from the very beginning in his speech, in his opening speech to the Royal, Royal Academy, they seem to be a guarantee for the demand of modernity, he said. So it is in this context, it is in this context where the Semper theory, Semper theories, particularly the one on coating, seem to be the consiling support between two positions. The theory of coating supports, as it is known, that the main motive of architecture, what he called ur motif, is the coating, thank you, is the coating of the material, is the coating. The coating and not the core or, or the hat is the essential element. The mechanical function of the core 
is symbolically expressed in the coating. In Vienna, there was an uninterrupted Baroque tradition from Fischer von Erlach, which rely in the externalizing of forms in the skin or coat, we can say, together, of course, with the own speciality of architecture, which relies on that external expression, uh, on that external uh, face, the expression of architecture. On the other hand, that innovation that Wagner asked, that demand for modernity, in his words, has to be circumscribed to a large extent, as time will prove, to rely the expression of forms, of the skin, of coating, to the technoid mechanisms, as for example, the nailing to the facade of the stone plates, for example, and to the new technologies which are not other thing than a help for installing that coating, a help, a medium, which, become, which became the last end of the expressiveness, expressiveness in architecture in Vienna. So, between the Baroque tradition and the innovation required by that demand of modernity, a complete antithesis will never entirely emerge, but a complement instead. Tradition in innovation will be the binomial which, to a large extent, thanks to the theory of coating by Semper, characterizes Wagner's and his school, the called Wagner Schule. So the Wagner Schule will continue the Baroque tradition of the facade as a great value in the expression of architecture, and at the same time, innovation appears in the mechanisms of the sticking of the skin or the coat. Pletnik will react against that. He will consider that the new materials have a value in themselves and not in the mechanisms necessary to stick <coughs> them as a coating to the facade. Plesnik has, in this sense, a Ruskinian attitude towards the materials of construction, and he will rely the expression of the walls to the own materials and not to the sticking mechanisms. This will explain his rejection for the secession, from which he was, in fact, the secretary, and he thought they became extremely banal and decorative. He will use all sorts of materials, even the most neglected or cheap, as means of expression, he was one of the first to use concrete in 1910 in the Church of the Holy Ghost in Otakrin in Vienna. In here, his capitals, uh, for example, anticipates to cubist architecture or expressionist architecture, as we'll see in a slide soon. So I can conclude that in the binomial innovation tradition, he was more open than the Wagner Schule, since he didn't emphasize the devices, the technoid mechanisms of sticking, etc but the new materials and the old ones, the noble materials and the neglected ones, anything in fact, all sorts of materials. Going, on, going now on his attitude of history, I have to say that is, as in Wagner, a Semperian idea, an idea which runs through the architectural culture in Europe since the arrival of the <coughs> neoclassicism in mid 18th century. With the following sentence by Semper, I think we can resume this idea of history. Semper said, architecture has created through centuries its own store of forms from which it borrows the types for the new creations. When using these types, architecture remains legible and understandable for everybody. The architect which disdains those conventional forms is like the author who limits his own language, adopting an outdated, strange, and self-invented order of words and way of expressions. He will be understood only with difficulty, and at least as author, he will not make his fortune. Well, he wouldn't have lost his originality at all if he would have used simplified and intelligible terms. Semper, as the neoclassical architects, considered the contribution of history to be decisive in the architectural production. Wagner and Pletnik continue in this way when they compose their buildings. In Wagner, the plans and the volumes <coughs> can be decomposed in autonomous figures. A project will, will contain different figures altogether, which one can almost, in every case, identify as seen before. The grouping is also made within an order, within a unity, a bit as Duran suggested. Plesnik does, or makes us Wagner, 
But on top of that, on top of the, this recollection of figures that Bainer groups in his plans, it has to be said that he incorporates not only elements of figures from a classical tradition, but also from early Christian, Byzantine, or vernacular architecture, particularly in his churches. So his idea of history is entirely open to the past, broadly open, as the first moderns, adopting a critical eclecticism and the, the light of the reason to help to achieve a specific character. Finally, to talk about his obsession for a permanent architecture is like talking on Architectura Perennis, which is the title of the book his compatriots dedicate to Pletny. Architectura Perennis, uh, it refers to eternal architecture, to everlasting architecture. Is the idea of an architecture that remains, that is permanent, that last. So this obsession for lasting architecture was achieved through few mechanisms, which are known mechanisms when one goes uh, to that goal, like, for example, trying to correspond construction and composition, compositional forms and constructive forms to be the same. Also, um, thanks to the value assigned to materials, as I mentioned before, and to the expression of these materials, that he knew how to use them, where to use them, how to combine them, as it can be seen in all his work. <coughs> and also, and probably in this case, I mean, in, our, in, in the purpose of, our, of this lecture, or this comment on, on, in, on national architecture, in the creation of a public acceptance of his architecture as a valid cultural fact that people can recognize as traditional, that people can identify in their memory, since Plesnik uses many vernacular ways of construction. So I think these three points that mark a clear difference in the standing of Plesnik and his master, his very, of course, respected master, Otto Wagner, may explain a bit uh, his search for a, uh, an architecture that can be linked to the Slavic uh, nations, Czechoslovakia, and mainly his native Slovenia. Among all his work, I have selected, I think, wait on now to see the slides. I have selected one church, because Plesnik, uh, Plesnik being deeply Catholic, he thought architecture could change the habits of people, and uh, he thought that uh, the plans and the spaces of churches should be reconsidered in order that participation of people in the liturgy was more active. Um, so, now I will only show one church that I intentionally brought in here to explain a bit the National Theatre, the National Library, sorry, of Ljubljana. So we have here on the left uh, Joseph Pletnik. On the right is the atelier of Wagner. We can see Wagner on the very left of the picture. And on the very right, just showing a bit the head, is Joseph Pletnik. We, we can see his very Slavic features in the face, very powerful. Very... So, we can see this church by, uh, by Wagner, in which uh, uh, he clearly wants to express this demand for modernity and the idea of a skin. On the right, the skeleton. On the, left, on the left, the skeleton has been covered with a skin of stone. And to such an extent, Wagner was coherent with that uh, sort of a bet for modernity that we can see on the left, for example, how the arch, instead of having the, the decomposition of little uh, dovelle, uh, in here, an arch should have uh, the discharge to express the construction. 
So the lines are cut like with a scissor. So one can see that this is only skin because the arch is cut as if we use a scissor. And not only that, inside there are gaps that show that the dome inside is just a skin. And we can see also how, for example, in this picture, Bagna and in any other cases, sticks the bits, as in the outside of that church, sticks the, the, bit, the elements to create the skin, to the structure. While this is a house in Vienna, while Wagner, or I, sorry, Pletnik, instead of using sticking uh, metal nails, he uses the same material in a very original and very talented way, I mean, pretty original. This, these vertical lines are pieces of granite that can allow the plates to enter behind, behind the line in such a way that he avoids the expression of nails, which was so loved by the secessionists and by Wagner, obviously, and very used in different buildings of Wagner, as you know. This is Sachel House in Vienna, considered by many his masterpiece. This is the church of, of, Ota, of uh, Otakring in Vienna, built in uh, concrete due to shortage of money, because the budget was cut. And, uh, Anyway, he loved the materials in a Ruskinian attitude, including concrete, which was, which was new and uncertain. And we can see the use of the love, really, in a Ruskinian way, of all sorts of materials, bricks, pieces of white stone, and even there's a taste of collage, which loving of materials it, it implies, in a sense, a love for collage. That's the wall, a piece of the wall in his house in Ljubljana, Well, and here is the crypt of Otakrin, in which he has to simplify his first project due to shortage of money. And the, the, this hyperstyle room is built with a concrete structure and the capitals uh, in, built, built in 1910. He anticipates uh, for at least, well, a decade and the fashion of Cubist architecture or expressionistic architecture. Well, and then going towards the National Library in Ljubljana, I want to show you first of all how in his mind this architect has to synthesize what he learned in Vienna and also his search for a national architecture. I think this little church of Bardje, St. Michael in Bardje, in the outskirts of Ljubljana can explain and help to understand quite a bit his future uh, project of, uh, well, his contemporary, in fact, but built <coughs> after the church, project of the National Library. So here there is a perspective uh, of, uh, of this, of the building, of the church. The church is very peculiar to be a church. If we remove the tower, we will not know that it's a church. It looks more like a hat in the mountains, and it's intended to look like a hat in the mountains, in a very vernacular way. His father and his family came from the mountains. Slovenia is very mountainous anyway, with rocky, very powerful mountains. So if we remove this tower, I insist, it's left a rectangle which is organized, if we see the perspective, based on four columns, the classical tetra style composition. Four columns in order to avoid any basilical or any more conventional layout to make a hall in a sense. <coughs> it's not precisely a hall in the English sense or in the Atlantic sense, but in, it includes the four columns. Then there is another, oh, and of course it's very curious, the location of the altar. The altar is on the larger side. On top of the columns, which are brought outside too, there is a collage, a mixture, a wall, which is stone and brick, like the natural architecture in the Caspian region, and uh, is filled with wood to increase the domestic flavor of the present. That was also an intentional planning, to make churches domestic.
and then the inclusion of wood helps to that. Very curious how it is organized, the church on the first floor is very rare. So we have to go up this long transit. So it is uncertain why it was on the first floor, on the first floor. whether it was because of, uh, of uh, water, I mean, uh, dam. Uh, but also it's been said because he made, there is a precedent in Prague in which he placed an altar of the, to the Virgin Mary on the very high floor of the tower, of the bell tower. So in such a way that we, we have a pilgrimage, we can say, towards the church. Something very internationally seen, I said, and I say international intentionally, all over Central Europe, those little churches on top of small hills dedicated to saints. So probably he emulates that here, placing the church on the first level and placing also this uh, bell tower. So I think St. Michael in Barge will synthesize as different sort of sources from the layout based on the tetra style room to the aspect in character to a, to a hat, a sort of vernacular hat in Slovenia. So we can see on the left more in detail this thing of the collage of materials, brick and stone. And uh, the inside, we see the four main points of support of the wooden structure. The domestic character is relied, relies very much on the use of wood. And look at how these columns are pipes of sewage, concrete, uh, very cheap material. And he depicts up to this height, which is roughly, roughly one third of height, which is the point in which the columns, based, let's say, on Vignola, for example, at one third of the shaft, they have to, to turn, to sort of twist the inflection, the emphasis. So depicting this sort of early Christian with an extensive, this, with this early Christian motive, very cheaply and very easy to paint on the on the concrete uh, pipe, he gives the effect of an emphasis, optical effect, because here is whiter than on top of there, on, on the on the other side. And then the disposition of the of the church looks very much again like a very domestic prison for any sort of collective use. Having, having seen Barge, the National Library appears as a very curious building in the collection of, of libraries in Europe because it's very <coughs> peculiar and uh, I think it has to be approached, well there are many approaches, but one of them, I mean, uh, considering that it was going to be the container of the books of the Slovene language, will help us to understand why this aspect of a fortress. If we see from a distance, the, the library, it looks like there are no windows, while the fenestration is very heavy if we approach the building. But from a distance, due to, the, to this mixture of a stone and brick, this rusticato, as in St. Michael Barbier in, in the previous church, one thinks is like the Seca, those buildings to produce money, the Seca in Venice, for example, you know, which is heavily rusticated by San Sovino, or many other buildings. It is also, so we have, we have in here the outside, it is also curious the plan, because most libraries that we know, the reading room occupies the center of gravity of the, of the library. Not in here. It's very laterally placed, the reading room. But it's intentionally laterally placed, because Plesby will have a long transit, a long, long transit in a baroque way, from darkness, let's say, because it's very dark, the entrance, from darkness to light, in a very symbolic way. So it, ha it has also been said that uh, the, fact, the fact that the, the wall is, has this rusticato of a stone and brick is like, uh, is like if the city is abandoning this very sort of romantic view that the Slovenian professor told me one. I think it's very, it's very, it's very nice. He said to me that uh, it's like uh, if Ljubljana abandons his stone dress, because it was a Roman town, and the Roman walls are very close to here, actually, 
So abandons his stone dress and wears a newer dress, which is Greek, a more modern dress. So the synthesis of both indicates like Ljubljana or the Slovenia emerging again. Well, I think it can be read like that too, because, <laughs> because it's a bit like that. It's like if the brick emerges from the stone. So we can see in this perspective, in this view, the reading looming here, and we see a big hole which corresponds to the core. That, and uh, curiously enough, that core is cut in two, as we see in the plan, by the introduction of the transit and the hole and the vestibule. But only to a certain level, and we'll see, I, I tell you that for, in a minute, we'll see the very curious approach by Fletchley in, in the ceiling of that transit. So, now some views of, the, of this building. You see what I said, the fenestration is pretty important in here. And from a distance, one seems there is no windows in this building. So, here a column, uh, a Ionic, uh, sort of Athenian, Athenian column, and uh, there are lots of little motives that remind us of the secession, left a lot of uh, resources, sort of compositional devices, motives. For example, these Oriel windows, so beloved by secessionist architects, and uh, we'll see in detail how this screen there that introduces the light to the reading room is treated in a very ambiguous way as a grid and also as a sort of superimposition of, a, of sets of pilasters. Well, this is, uh, well, I think those pictures just to reveal a bit with the sun how the rusticato, how the, the stones disappear you know, when we go further up, you know, the stones sort of uh, get flatter, we can say. Yes, this ambiguity to which I referred before is in here. The first glimpse, the first lecture, the first reading is like a grid, the screen. And in here, if we observe, the vertical elements are twisted on top to create a sort of capital, in, in other words, to make series of horizontal, we could say, terons, in a sense. So it's organized, you see, capital, capital, it's organized like horizontal lines, instead of being a complete grid, all flat. All these little details reveal, no doubt, of course, one can understand why he was proposed to direct the Viennese Academy, this guy. Anyway, those are more views of the heavy rusticato and the, this idea of fragments of collage, he adds these two fragments of bronze to this column, to this uh, capital. So the National Library has this external aspect that could be linked to a problem of character, as I mentioned before. A ca the character as the, as the, as, uh, the sort of, uh, um, element that is going to uh, solve this uh, stylistic uh, amount, this, uh, this, this great amount of uh, stylistic revivalisms in the 19th century. So as a problem of character, the, 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 the facade of the National Library has its own entity. The, the inside, it's a, a complete different story. Well, two more bits of the outside in the with these secessionist mechanisms of taking the, the doors out. In this lateral door and in the main entrance door, we can see the wall that comes out on both sides in a sort of concave way and takes the door out, like secessionist architects did. So this a sketchy perspective has the transit you see, with a non-stop in the, in the, um, there is no landing in the flight of the steps. Um, 
and it goes straight away directly to the big uh, reading room. On the right is the vestibule, which is blocked today. As we see in the picture, those, those things are blocking the entrance, so one has to go laterally. But originally it was thought to go straight ahead through that door, which is blocked. Well, on the left, there is a detail of that hall we saw. And he uses this blackish and grayish marble to increase the effect of shadow of uh, uh, umbria, of uh, yeah, sort of shadow, we can say. And, uh, well, that is marble, and those steps are made in artificial stone. And I have to say, I all, I all the time say, as a, a small personal homage, homage to a Slovenian uh, craft, craftsman, uh, the degree of perfection of the artificial stone of the Slovenian is extraordinary. In 1938, 1940, when this building was made, a contemporary of Corbusier's, for example. So once we have crossed that door, we have this long flight of the steps, which is surrounded by walls, unprecedented in its effect, because not only the fact that it's surrounded by walls, but also the fact that is the, the, the stone is, is blackish, or black and grayish, and the fact that there's a light at the end, it has no doubt in, in the memories, in my memories, one reminds immediately, let's say, a similar effect, similar, in the Scala Regia, for example. Uh, well, a very Baroque effect. There is a similar, just as a curiosity, there is a similar steps, a similar flight of steps in a building by uh, von Gardner in Munich. But in the, in the building of von Gardner, there is a landing and it breaks the rhythm, you know, the, the sensation of ascending, of even, I would say, getting tired until one arrives to the landing. This effect is increased also when one realizes that the room to which one is going to land is full up of columns. It's a hypostyle room. So the effect is uh, a, a quite a curious effect. So this is from the top of the... So we, we, we enter that point. Look at the use of different color in the marbles. It goes from this pinky to this grayish, to this blackish, to this introducing this tiny little white line, using those consoles of stone like uh, to avoid falling into the gap of the... <coughs> so, from the use of concrete, pi of pipes of concrete in the church of St. Michael in Balje, to the use of this rich material, in which uh, these consoles are, you see, this, this is stone with, with these uh, white lines is the same he uses in the outside. And in the outside, it, it gets gray and differentiated. Black, gray, all, all this uh, display, which is very, very secessionist in the sense that of richness. So this is under the flight of steps, a tetrastyle room, it's the storage of books, and we can see the combination of the orders, how he manipulates the use of orders, very thin elements in the carpentry, very thick and powerful columns to the four columns of the tetrastyle room. The use of technology in the service staircases, the four lateral staircases, very advanced because the, stair the steps are supported by those vertical pipes. Well, this picture on the left does not belong to the National Library. It's in a house in Ljubljana, but it's just to show how brave he was relying on technology like that. How he really loved all technology. He was very modern in that respect, in that demand of modernity. And finally, the reading room, which is a very functional, big space. With wood, he has to fight the fire regulation because he has problems to put that in wood to make domestic the character with this little twist to make it shorter the effect. All furniture and everything, and look at the, is his, and look at this uh, bridge 
with the rails also very technological, we can say. So I think uh, uh, Pletnik uh, with the National Library tried to integrate his knowledge from Vienna and the vernacular tradition of Slovenia. Thank you. game that the children we had to play, uh, we had to stand up and to make uh, in five minutes a connection between uh, a toothbrush and a zip, and how these two things uh, can possibly be linked. Uh, in, on, on the face of it, there's three, three papers uh, exhibit a comparable gap, but perhaps not so. Uh, it seems to me that the, if there is any common, common denominator, then it would be probably around the question of the agent of uh, each of these movements or the agent for the national myth. And it seems to me that in all cases uh, it's quite clear that this agent has to be uh, the bourgeoisie, a particular kind of bourgeoisie. It's not uh, the cosmopolitan uh, as such, but perhaps part of it, it has to have both connection, external connection and the enormous need of various uh, kind of needs to establish its own. I'm reminded of the Loth, uh, sorry, the Wittgenstein's house in Vienna has been acquired a few years ago as a saving a grace by the Bulgarians who have established there the cultural center on condition that they, they don't alter, uh, alter anything of the, of the character of the house. Well, they didn't. They dug a, a huge basement where immediately when you uh, pass a threshold from the house itself into the basement, you get the transition from high culture, international if you like, into uh, folkloristic, highly colored and so on. But moreover, outside the house there are two sculptures, very large sculptures, larger than life size, of two monks, Kirill and Method. The two monks, as you probably know, about a thousand years ago introduced the Kirillic letters into the Slavic-speaking uh, people. And so you have the house and these two uh, monks in, in, uh, in a sort of social realist style, two monks, who introduced the script, which in fact is the base of, of all of it. I, I was very struck in the discussion of, um, of uh, uh, the uh, Finnish um, uh, national uh, development that indeed the monks or the church uh, really was the first recorder of what was to become the national heritage. And the church, of course, uh, one could not claim it to be indigenous in any of these, uh, in these uh, cases. And so it is in the case of the, uh, of the uh, Bernadotte's uh, uh, children who were, in fact, uh, I think 150,000 of them have been exported onto the empire. But it's obviously that the elite, the cultural elite, shall we say, there and here, do not consider those who don't belong to, uh, to itself, or are not bona fide members of this elite, to represent uh, this uh, national identity at all. So in the case of these 150,000 children, it was uh, thought that uh, uh, it would be more useful, they would uh, provide more useful function if they, uh, if they were spread around in the empire rather than uh, maintain their so-called identity. So to come back to my original point, I therefore suggest that, that if there is any sense, uh, any agent which, uh, which did or does make sense of uh, such claims, it usually uh, has to be uh, seen to be, seen to be uh, connected with a uh, particular social group. And in fact, the, uh, the, the larger irony of um, 
the involvement of the church, of course, is that from the point of, of the point of view of the church, it is uh, far from uh, uh, from theological point of view uh, to think of any uh, territorial or any kind of earthly boundary as, as a home in any uh, profound sense. So I think that uh, perhaps with these few comments we can um, have a discussion. Please. Yes. Uh, question to uh, Makeda. Uh, well, uh, I have some difficulties uh, with the uh, interpretation of uh, Herder as uh, uh, a great national, uh, nationalist thing. Uh, and it's a very fine. Uh, can I answer you? I can answer that right away. I, I didn't mean to say that. I think that. Okay. I think there is a fine point in the fine distinction. Uh, the question is whether uh, nationalist uh, intentions, nationalist aims, uh, were the primary concern of her. Uh, I think that, on the contrary, uh, Herder uh, uses the notion of nation uh, in order uh, to discover another notion, the notion of folk. Uh, and the notion of folk is opposed to a conception of man uh, as an educated, enlightened, uh, um, rational being. Uh, Perhaps it, 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 is, it is interesting to, to, to see this uh, also on a linguistic level. Uh, normally, uh, we translate in English the word Deutsch as German. That's not very correct. Uh, the German word of German uh, is Germanic. Uh, Deutsch, in the country, or in the initial form, Polish means Völkisch, uh, uh, which is uh, people-like, or people-ish, or uh, uh, folk-like. So <clears throat> uh, for Herder, I think, uh, it's, uh, the, the word Deutsch uh, is, uh, uh, is used in this, uh, in this sense uh, as a, as a, <clears throat> as a uh, conception of uh, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of a culture which stands in opposition uh, to uh, uh, the the uh, 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 to a vernunft founded uh, 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 notion of culture uh, to a notion of culture uh, which is bound with logic. No, I, I completely agree with you. Uh, um, and I think I was trying to make a point also. Uh, I think I did make a point saying that um, basically his ideas were contra the enlightenment totalizing rationalization and you know the, the, the reasoning man, you know, the sort of terror of reason. This is a question of primary concern. Mm -hmm. Whether it is a uh, the nation or uh, the alternative culture. Alternative to the. <coughs> well, the, the irony here, of course, is the, the term, the term culture was really introduced by a man who stood more than anybody else for a reason, and that was uh, Voltaire. Uh, so the combination is rather fraught with difficulties. I think that I tried to use it. Uh, yesterday, uh, that the idea of culture as, a, as an independent idea uh, came from that source. But it was Voltaire who said to uh, Frederick II that uh, the German was fit to, the German the language was fit to speak only to horses. And obviously that kind of uh, conflict between the ideal of culture 
which uh, was sovereign, uh, connected with the Enlightenment and so on, uh, was so, uh, I would say, overbearing or challenging that the uh, reaction, the folkish reaction, it seems to be a reaction to that rather than something which uh, had its own source in a way. It acquires source. Yeah. Since we're going back ahead, I mean, you can just make it much more broadly and simply in the sense, which is that, shall we say, at the end of the 18th century, the entire analysis of what language is completely changes. I mean, up to then, in kind of universal grammar, <coughs> whatever. You know, the function of language is to represent and to analyze. From like the, the rise of historical linguistics in Bob or in Grimm. In a sense, language becomes a different sort of object. It's a combination of a sound and a meaning, but where meaning really means kind of expression. And one of the things that language from now on will be taken to express uh, is a nation. And, and, and so really one the, the question of the nation has entered into the very definition of language as such, which of course it simply doesn't. Especially in the North. But the reason I just wanted I mean, to add, can I just ask a question which was really directed to Stefan? One of the distinctions that you drew between the refugee and the native one, in effect, comes down to where your parents die. Mm. Um, I wondered like, if you could say something about uh, what in this sense, I mean, the, the, the nation comes fundamentally to, to, to involve the fantasy about dead parents. And very. Well, yes, I, I, I think that the question of ancestry, which is always a great, whenever the notion of ethnicity or national belonging is talked of, is always a reference to dead parents. I quite agree with that. And the, the, the romantic claims to an earth, or coming from an earth, a countryside, a site, whatever it might be, can take various forms, is also a claim is a notion of <coughs> the place in which one's parents were buried, or the place from which one was born, which is the same thing. And the fantasy of the dead parent is also the fantasy of being born from that earth. Just, but the, I, I think that the whole, whatever Anderson means by the imaginaries or mythicness of a nationalism is to do with, uh, it is always a romanticization or myth, myth, mythologization of some rootedness beforehand. As if before the nation, or before there was modernity, there was this thing called tradition, in which people really were rooted, which is, uh, an, which is itself a fantasy of nationalism. I think you got it. There's something that, that, that struck me. Uh, to the debate up to now, in which is that, uh, in, especially in architectural terms, uh, it has been made a dichotomy between nationalism and internationalism, especially in uh, if one talks about the, the modern project. There is a certain kind of fantasy in the terms uh, that you have expressed uh, of an uh, international model against the 19th century drawn of different styles uh, which were allegedly uh, more traditional. Yeah. Now, I, I think that the Soviet paper um, and especially the, the methodology of uh, his analysis uh, on the compositional strategy on, of Plechnik mm -hmm. actually destroys that argument uh, extremely well and especially uh, destroys the kind of analysis that Tim Benton was doing uh, yesterday afternoon, which actually left me particularly uneasy in uh, its uh, generality, because it was actually drawing uh, on what I thought was a false argument, which a series of contributions.
floor actually were pointing out uh, bit by bit uh, the fact that uh, in that detail it doesn't work, in this detail it doesn't work, in this detail it doesn't work. And, and Tim continued to think that the edifice of his argument as a whole did work and, and actually, you know, it actually little by little crumbled to pieces. Now, the kind of analysis that, 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 that you have done and which I do completely shows that, 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 that there's a certain moment of time uh, um, through the vernacular, and which is one of the uh, uh, analysis, uh, categories of analysis that Roy was drawing attention to as uh, um, indigenous, if I'm correct, uh, at the beginning of, of the conference. Uh, that was actually a source of fantasy, of invention, of myth, uh, to come back to a notion of uh, modernism. And modernism was certainly possible internationally because uh, human fantasy of uh, the different people that traveled from Ljubljana to Vienna, from Vienna to Rome and so forth, uh, um, made it possible to be international. And because uh, there is uh, something which is architectural fantasy, architectural creation, architectural discourse, uh, which brings those things into it, which is different than the nationalism of the, the Europe of the post-Council you know, post of Vienna sort of situation. Now, when the argument becomes complicated, and I think it falls down on false distinction, is that when actually we introduce the category of a repressive or progressive government, it doesn't, it doesn't make a difference at this point, which needs to be represented, its ideology needs to be represented through monumentals. And that was a word that Tim went to the Unix used yesterday, and which I think makes the whole distinction between internationalism and nationalism actually very, very important, because it transmutes the analysis that what we can do into a cultural analysis of myth, rather than into the analysis of the compositional method that the architect used within his discourse in the same in the way in which uh, you actually reconstruct uh, his, uh, his method. And that, I mean, I, I, I wish I could do it as well as, uh, as you did, uh, um, in many, many more cases. Uh, so actually to cut the grass under the feet of certain kind of, of discourses that for me are not as very graphic on the on movement today. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Well, we're further away from the remark that I wanted to make, but I, I don't think I agree very much if I understood correctly to categorize folk and national as two se separate categories as such, because at the same century, the reason why Folk, there was an interest in the folk, was not for its own sake, but, part, but partly to see how far people went from that folk origins, how they mastered it, even in the way they internalized the elements of it as a part of their nationalism. And it links up very well with the, the idea of evolution, for example. And in that respect, I think folk was a category which was created by, by the others uh, for a specific use, rather than being analyzed for its own sake. And we can look at the same thing if, if, if we can give the example from England, for example. If you look at Sharp's uh, songs, you know, there was a lot of interest in folk songs a little bit later than the kinds that you were talking about. But all those folk songs were created. And then they became national songs, which were taught to school children in uh, the school of Britain. And in the way they selected the songs, uh, it was very interesting how they selected those songs, which they thought <coughs> represented the folk songs, which should also represent the nation. Uh, I think in that respect, I don't see it as an alternative to nationalism, but as a category which is created by nationalism itself and internalized uh, in, in a certain I, I, I actually disagree with you, and I, did, I, I agree with what Sir Patricia was saying. Um, I, think, I think that nationalism too, at least historically in Germany, is a sort of degeneration of, of the interest in the 
and yet the ethnic comes first and the nationalism as it develops in maybe in opposition to Napoleon is a kind of is a, an appropriation, arguably a misappropriation. For example, Panda is influenced by Hama. Hama's interest in land has nothing to do with German nationalism. His main interest is in um, the theological understanding of Hebrew, not of German at all, and his, his reading of <coughs> Appropriation of power in, in the more German thinkers with the Romantics, who also, at least people like Novalis, were not at least nationalistic in any kind of simplistic sense, but were intensely interested in notions of language. And this, I mean, Novalis is sort of myth of, of nature speaking, for example, has nothing to do with nationalism. It's about metaphysics and meaning, which, which is really what Mark tends to think of Mark as saying, but equally, uh, it, slightly goes against, I think, a little bit of what um, Jeff was saying, I think, yesterday, and arguably what Yehuda was saying. That is to say that language doesn't have to be associated with frontiers and barriers in the way that nationalism makes it. I mean, the initial interest in the ethnic is not actually concerned with the frontier, it's concerned with a different experience of language. But obviously, you're talking about many things that we could not be, unfortunately, I don't think we could uh, go on, uh, but uh, later on. It is clear that there are stages in this development. It is clear that <coughs> Hegel uses the Volksgeist as a, as, a, as a political concept, become the concept of nationalism. That appears in the, in the philosophy of history, um, page number one, uh, where he makes it absolutely clear that in the center of all the political institutions come the idea of the nation, Volksgeist, and so on. And unfortunately, I don't think we can uh, go on the memory. So thank you. Uh, just quickly, we think there's a very short break, even shorter than it was. Uh, we started off short. It's not, we, we, we...